co-hosting the John Telford Detroit Show with Dr. John Telford coming to you live at 10 o'clock every Thursday morning on WJZZ Cool TV, streaming on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Dr. John Telford is a former Detroit Public School Superintendent, a former world-class athlete, and conqueror of Olympic champions, a championship track coach, poet, newspaper columnist, longtime civil rights crusader, and the author of six Detroit-oriented books, The Poet Emperor of Earth, What Old Men Know, Creative Insubordination, The Will Robinson Story, The Poetic Prancings of Mad John, his explosive autobiography, A Life on the Run, and another forthcoming poetry book, Athlete, Activism, and Apple Bows, A Detroit Poetic Epic. He also has a show on WCHB AM 1340, Detroit's Gospel Station, Saturday mornings at 9.30 and Monday evenings at 6.30. That's Saturday mornings, 9.30 and Monday evenings at 6.30. His books are available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, or just call him the good doctor at 313-460-8272. That's 313 313-460- Eight two seven two. Dr. John Telford has been called a legend and also a lightning rod for controversy. He has received the Detroit City Council Spirit of Detroit Award and the Joe Lewis Foundation Spirit of the Champ Award. He was named Wayne State University's Alumnus of the Year in 2001 and a Detroit track was named for him. His email is drjohntelfordedd at aol.com. That's D-R-J-O-H-N-T-E-L-F-O-R-D-E-D-D at AOL.com. Now, without further ado, I present to you that crusading old native Detroiter, Dr. John Telford. Thank you, Dr. Sunanda Corrado. And stay close to that mic, Sunanda. I hope that they're picking you up. Uh, Dr. Sunanda Corrado is a Ph.D. from Columbia University. Uh, who is an anthropologist by training. And Dr. Corrado has been teaching at Wayne County Community College District for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Look at her. She looks like she's about 17 years old. How could she have been teaching there that long? Uh, but she has been, and she's currently a researcher for the Detroit Equity Action Lab housed in the WSU Law School and founder and CEO of Education by Design. We have in the studio today... It's our great honor, and I'm trying to clear my throat at the same time. It's our great honor to have in the studio today Linda Bernard, Esquire, mm -hmm. Attorney Linda Bernard, Police Commissioner Linda Bernard, and we are going to be interviewing Linda Bernard today. But first, I have to do, well, you know, this is supposed to be a poetry show, too, so let's do, let's do my poem, Blue Salt. Blue Salt, <clears throat> my name is Detroit. I'm a blue-collar town. Blue salt melts my mid-March snow. Speedy cars and sprinters spring from me. I father fierce fighters in funky music. In a Motown moment, I can spit the blues right back in a bureaucrat's eye. <laughs> Have you never seen blue salt? No complex chemistry here, only the old color of a new sky. And there's a new sky dawning over Detroit today. And one of the reasons why it is dawning over Detroit today, and we see we see some, some light coming through the clouds, is that we do have <coughs> we do have Linda Bernard in the <laughs> studio today. And I'm so glad that there are two other folks talking because I can't seem to clear my throat today. But you know, I still have to <coughs> I still have to make my announcements. That I, that I promised. For example, I promised Miss Virginia Starkey, fondly known simply as V, the proprietress of V's Boutique, mm. uh, offers a wide range of fine clothing and accessories for ladies. It's the truth. And you can find <laughs> all sizes I love of... It there. That's good. Well, you know, and she's going to him. I'm going to oh talk about God. it. You, you can find all sizes of women's uh, apparel, fine apparel, in V's one stop excellent customer service at V's boutique that you can't find anywhere else in Detroit. And lots of beautiful white cotton, cotton gowns. 
Oh I, man. I love linen in the stone. And she yeah, goes all oh over the God. country, you know, oh, uh, finding stuff, you know, but the um, stone jewelry. Uh, oh, but you know, this this coming Sunday, November the twenty first, between one o'clock PM and six o'clock PM, V is sponsoring a come what is it? She wrote this down. Sponsoring a, 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 anyway, c- come and shop and sip and, and just have a, a general good time and, and eat. You know, she's going to have food there too. A come, shop, sip, and eat mm-hmm. gathering. So this is the grand opening, right? And, and this, her shop relocated from. Yeah, from she the was river in the river house. house where she lives and where I live. And uh, then she, she went back at, to right next to Alger Theater. Yeah, and the but library. We need to interview her about that, about her, her problems with trying to keep her property and the Alger Theater district. As a black woman, we're gonna. Yeah, do it. it's we're been an amazing experience for her trying to come back in there and get it open up again. Well, yeah. you know, we've got Letitia Johnson on the on the uh, city council now. That's in that area, so um, we'll, there's not gonna be any more problems there. You know, Letitia is on. Thank goodness. You'll let us know. Yeah, there've been some good things happening in that election. You know, Letitia got in, and some other progressive people got in, even though Anthony Adams was defeated, which was uh, unfortunate, but. Uh, Okay, I got another. Uh, Wait, before you finish, sure. where's where is Z's boutique? Mm-hmm. The location. V, V's boutique. It's oh, V or oh, Z? V is a V. 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 E. E. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, a good thing that, that, that right, you reminded right me. Right next to Alger Theater. No, she. We, there's an there's an address too. Yeah. One six four two three East Warren. One six four two three East Warren. Right down the street mm-hmm. from uh, East English Village uh, Academy. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, by the way, I'm I'm going to do my uh, uh, poetry presentation tomorrow. We're we're going AKA there. To, Finney. Yeah, used yeah. to be. Oh God, East CBS English Village. Yeah, it, it's built on the site of the old Finney High School. Yeah. And they should have named it the new Finney High School they because should, yeah. the they Finney should have. the Finney family were abolitionists. You know, people don't recognize that fact or know about it. But uh, Jared Finney and Seymour Finney, they met with John Brown here in Detroit. Yeah. You know the the great uh, martyred uh, abolitionist. Mm-hmm. They met yeah. with. Uh, um, it's a movie about him. Is there? Yes. Oh, good. I would love to see that movie. Uh, they they also <laughs> met with uh, Frederick Douglass uh, yeah. here in Detroit, in, <laughs> another uh, great uh, abolitionist who was not martyred. And um, and I actually my home school now is Frederick Douglass. I do my I have a poetry class there that I I meet every week. But okay, here's another press statement from me. Hmm. Uh, because I think, I think, Sunanda, that we should talk a little bit about what we're doing on December the 9th. Absolutely. Do you want to say anything about and, that before I do? Um, no, I'm just so glad um, Linda Bernard is here because we could really break down why it's worth coming out to this event. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut right now. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. This, this is going to be in the form of a press release, but, uh, you know, as the former superintendent of the Detroit Public Schools, uh, I, I believe that um, it was really important for me and my group to, 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 to I'm, I'm, I'm hosting. Sorry. Police Commissioner Linda Bernard. Oh, please. Yeah, Police oh. Commissioner Linda Hello. Bernard. Oh, attorney God. Linda Bernard. The only attorney uh, on the, uh, how many police officers are on that? There, uh, well, there's several police officers, um, but I'm the only lawyer on the board. So the only lawyer on the board, uh, all and right. And it's a civilian Lisa committee. Carter is a former sheriff. Of course, uh, you you know that Bell is a former chief, and not chief, but a lieutenant, uh, I guess, in the Detroit Police Department. But that's it. But go back to your announcements. I'm, yeah, I, I just wanted okay. to... Uh, that's interesting. I wanted to share this information, you know, on parochiate. This this program, which I am I'm hosting at the Detroit Yacht Club, you know, being a member there, uh, is about parochiate and, and giving public money to private schools is a no-no, you know, as the Trump-skewed Supreme Court is doing, uh, uh, I'm talking about the U.S. Supreme Court, is not only gravely injurious to public education, but it's also unconstitutional. And yet, other local activists uh, involved in, uh, include, including several uh, preachers, I'm, mm. I'm sorry to say, um, and other local religious leaders, support it. Mm. So, uh, this enlightening forum at the DYC on Thursday, December the 9th at 5.30 p.m. measures up to become possibly a most contentious event, I would, because, I would suspect. You know, faith, faith is the nexus of it, right? I mean, a lot of minority communities identify themselves through their faith. So even as we call it parochial, we're talking about Hindu temples, we're talking about Jewish temples, 
Muslim mosques, right? That's right. Also being Buddhist. able to establish schools. But this, yeah. So there's a huge consortium of faith-based minorities, I would say, that are behind Parochi, which makes it very interesting. Well, it makes it very interesting, but it's also separation of church and state, and that's what our, you know, we... From the we, Anglican we, church, historically. Yeah, well, Anglican, correct. Because this was about the Blaine Amendment. I don't know the Blaine Amendment, but yeah, the Angl Anglican yeah. Church uh, uh, was involved in, in making that happen at the, at the, in the 18th century. Uh, and Dr. Peter Hammer uh, from Wayne State is going to be the keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Hammer, I happen yeah. to know, totally opposes <laughs> parochial aid. He wrote so. the, an amicus brief on behalf of the ACLU or with them. He collaborated on, on the whole uh, push against it as well, so he knows a lot about it. He has a very storied history. Hmm. And, and we have invited okay. a couple of preachers. Uh, one of them was a kid that I coached at, at uh, Southeastern in track. He's my best quarter miler in 1961. The Reverend Arco C. Brooks is yes. going to be going to be on the panel. Uh, and also, uh, there, there's another preacher that I'm not acquainted with, but he has a very good reputation, Pastor Keith Graham. Yes. Uh, and Dr. Shea Howell is going to be on that panel. Uh, Heather Dell is going to be on the panel. I'm going to be on the panel. Um, Elena Harada is going to be on the panel. And, uh, and and attorney Tracy Peters is going to be on that panel. Actually, we should have had you on that panel. Uh, you wouldn't mind. Oh, I don't uh, mind. Certainly, oh. if I'm here, I'll be happy to participate. But no, how no, comes no. nobody from the archdiocese? That, that you know what? Because it, this started as more of a, a dialogue or a discourse into like the liberal groups because it's not being talked about. I would like to have the next thing to be more about faith-based organizations having a discussion with citizens. This is just as, you see, as opposed to a liberal versus conservative argument, I want to talk about um, building up our communities and regenerating our communities by establishing schools in our small churches. This is what's going on with regentrification anyway. People aren't sending their schools to charter, their kids to I mean, charter kids public school. Yeah. They're, they're moving into Indian Village and they're refurbishing the church next door. They're already asking city council for money to refurbish those churches and they're turning them into schools this year K through two, next year K through three. So this is happening anyway, but it's not happening for our kids and we're not getting access to that money. And, and the, my thing is like Democrats represent themselves as a secular group, which is fine, but minority Democrats tend to be faith-based. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Vitti is sending his lobbyist uh, on her, her name is uh, Sharice Butler, yes. and I might defer to her and let Thank her you. take my place. But I would let you take my place too no, if no, you can. No, no, no. no we, we've we already got you know, got a lot of panelists. We don't. Yeah. Want I'm to not, I don't. Yeah, yeah. You don't. You want to be able to hear your panelists. No, I, I, I'll come. I just want to hear what they have to say. Well, what I have to say is that even in light of the U.S. Superintendent, the, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, what what the, what they what they mm. what they've decided uh, that that. Uh, uh, this has gone deliberately unpublicized. Yes, it uh, happened June 2020 in the middle of COVID. This case has been going on for decades. And in the middle of COVID, June 2020, they, they, they passed the decision that um, not funding parochial schools is a discriminate, discriminatory practice against them. Well, until, until... How do they get around the Constitution? Well, the church that's the very point. Ah. What they're doing how is they, unconstitutional. They, they rationalize it somehow. We, well, we have a Trumpist sure Supreme Court. But here's so the perhaps thing. we need to expand the Supreme Court and get this thing reversed. But in the meantime, that's we've 30 got... Years. Well... Uh, Our no, kids have already suffered 30 years. Well, and we got they're going to continue to... we got two generations in prison right now for this shit. I'm serious. Yeah. We don't have time for court. Well, <laughs> you know, we're going to have to find a way to accommodate ourselves to this decision. And there are some ways they that can... It. I uh, Creative ways that I think we can do it. Maybe but we can... Maybe we can maybe start some some schools in the K twelve uh, under K twelve uh, uh, auspices. But, but but the problem that I see is that it's really just a money game. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's always yeah. been I mean, game. everybody has created a charter school mm -hmm. that doesn't really do anything, Precisely. and that has no ability to equip students for the twenty first century. That's true. Uh, and they don't have the even with the resources they get at eight or nine thousand per kid. Um, you know, that's not enough to, to outfit a labs and do the things that's that right. you can do through right. uh, and, and sports and music and art and the things that are the lawn. For, for, yeah, for, for a real for a real academic experience. 
which is what kids need. Actually, I, I may you may disagree with me, but I've always thought really that kids in Detroit, what we need. I said this twenty five years ago. What 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 we need it was was boarding schools. The the, the most homes are so dysfunctional oh, that if if we could just my friends in England, their their kids go to private school. Yeah. They leave for school on Sunday at about four o'clock. They catch the train. They got on their low uniforms. They, they go to the weekend. They come back Friday yeah, because okay. their parents are busy. Both parents are lawyers or, or whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, the point of the matter is, is that children need structure. They need to go to bed at a certain time, get up at a certain time, eat, and, and be focused on 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 maturation. On, on, mm-hmm. And we can't do that because if I'm not going to bed till one o'clock, I'm eating potato chips on my way to school. Mm-hmm. My hair isn't calm. I haven't eaten birch and cheese. Is not even thought of. I mean, if I'm just doing this, and then I come come to school, and I have a teacher, unfortunately, many times who may have credentials, but I I spoke at the Martin Luther King um, Day celebration at a school, and the teacher misspelled the word anniversary oh, on on Lord. on the on the board. That's a third grade word. Yeah, true. So right. I'm like, um, you know, it's just it's just totally it, we just have an abyss. Mm-hmm. I just really think kids need, and I think most parents would be okay. Yeah. Kids leave on Sunday, but kids are coming back on Friday. Why? I don't need to be there all week. I need to be focused. This is a whole different program. We got to we got to have you on again. No, that's, commercial, that's commercial, amazing. commercial, commercial, and commercial. And you're watching the John Talbert Detroit Show coming to you live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, and other top social media platforms. Please like, follow, share, comment, and subscribe to our program and various other offerings. And thank you for watching WJZZ Cool TV the coolest station in the world. Don't forget, December 9th, Thursday, we're going to have um, a public discussion about parochia at the Detroit Yacht Club, um, hosted by Dr. John Telford and the Highland Park Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, we got the Highland Highland Park Chamber of Commerce in there. We are also going to have Tim Moore. He's going to be videotaping it again, just the way he came and videotaped that uh, UCAC meeting that I, I brought him in to do. Um, and before I forget, too, I, I have to let my uh, watchers and listeners be aware that uh, I've got my Poets Corner right now. It's still on the right. stands, uh, Wednesday, November the 17th, Downtown Monitor. Um, and the, po- the poem this, this month is, um, is a Zeitgeistian prayer, which I'm not going to r- uh, recite again because I did. I'm, I'm going to give this to you, Linda. Thank you. And, um, and oh, and, and also, good thing I put this in here. You What's know, a Zeitgeistian? Zeitgeistian is an adjective. Zeitgeist is the noun. The Zeitgeist is okay. Maybe I will read it. Ze- zeitgeist is the spirit of the time, contemporary time, zeitgeist. The, the present. Mm. Yeah, here's here's the so I, yeah here's the <laughs> prayer. Great fate, pray thee, I would you'd free the seer in me, that I may see the wind, and be the rain. And know the starlit snow. Because within the mystical zeitgeist of this challenging century, we true educators have to make sure that our kids can see the unseen. I agree. And rain their accumulated knowledge that they got from us onto the world. And know the as yet unknown. That's what we need to do as agree. educators. That's I what true agree. educators do. But any, okay, another Greatest publication. Yes, I do have to reprogram it again for my mother. <laughs> and another, and another publication that's out on the stands right now is uh, the Detroit Native Sun. Mm. And I've not only is the Telford Telescope in there, my column, uh, which I think I talk about my my poetry uh, reading out in the schools this time, because nobody else is going to publicize it. So I publicize it. You know, I have the opportunity to do that because I write a column every month in that paper called the Telford Telescope. But, but I have another, another something in there, an article that is called, uh, the, uh, the, the title of this article is called Give Thanks and Get Activated because we are now in the month of Thanksgiving. So, uh, and, and we, are, we are privileged to have Linda Bernard in the, in the studio today, and I'm going to give her that, this column, too. I'm, Thank I'm loading you very her down. much. I'm loading Linda down with reading material. No, no, I love I'm, it. I'm giving, yeah. her, I'm giving her my, my, I put my life in your hands, Linda. I put my legs right in your hands. That's a life that. on the run. 
Um, I love this yeah. book. And please pick it up at Amazon. You said and everyone else else. Oh, you you can... should the, the commentary on the back from the people who read it is incredible. From Yule mm-hmm. Perkins, Ken Cockrell, John Powell, Doctor Wayne Dwyer, who mm-hmm. many of us have paid lots of money for his books. Spencer Haywood, uh, Hester Wheeler. It's worth reading. Should Thank be you. required reading for the schools. They, and you know all because the they don't open books, but they, 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 they've all got, this, this book is in all the high schools, uh, oh, but but mm-hmm. with the with the caveat that only upperclassmen can read it because it's a little R rated. Mm. Uh, but anyway, um, you know the the purpose of bringing you on the show today was to talk about you, mm. and we're gonna I'm gonna start by asking you to tell my watchers and listeners, our watchers and listeners, a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I'm a native Detroiter. I actually was raised most of my life in uh, in District 2, all of my life. Um, I went to St. Gregory's no. for 12 years at Dexter and Finkel. we got to have a perky thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Domain knows for Biscum et cum spiritu tuo. But anyway, in those days, you had to le- know the Learn mass in Latin, stuff. and you had to take Latin for... Panis angelicus, You're right. Panis hominum. Right. Dai panis colicus figuris terminum. I have no idea what I'm singing. Oh, yes. But I was taught this by Miss Burdock, hmm. my music teacher at Esterbrook Elementary School, a public K-8 through school hmm. at Linwood and McGraw hmm. of the early 1940s. But see, that's a good thing because what yes. you really, you learn Latin. Which is, which is what the mass used to be. And so Latin, we had to take Latin for four years. Um, and that was mandatory. You had to take Latin. So you, you learned, you know, certain uh, Latin colloquialisms and, of course, you know, songs in, in Latin. And to read and write in Latin. Much of our language has Latin roots. But That's there correct, are, there the English language. There are also language. many, many parts of our language that have Germanic roots. Hmm. You know, our, our language is such a mishmash. Uh, it, the English language is a very, very hard language. Uh, uh, hard language it's to, really to, a to learn. language at this point. Yeah. The English wouldn't recognize it. That, mm-hmm. that is true. They, 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 they would not. Um, no, so I was from Detroit. Yeah. Went to um, went to Wayne State University's Monteith Honors College. Finished mm-hmm. in three years. Uh, then went to law school. Finished law Who school there. Who was running there. Monteith then? Um, I I've forgotten. Uh, doctor, uh, I mean. White, white beard. Old guy with a white beard. I can't remember his name. You know Dr. I can't. Feinstein? I, I know who he is. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, I interrupted you. Tell us. No, about and then Wayne's Law School, and then I went to, to the University of Pennsylvania to earn a Master's of Law mm. from Penn. Wow. Well, I was their first African American to Ivy earn League, a Master's Ivy of Law. League. Two Ivy Leaguers here, you know, mm-hmm. Columbia and University of Pennsylvania. But, but you're an Ivy Leaguer too. You got all those D's behind your name: PhD, EHEDD, EDU. But the only way I'm an Ivy Leaguer was that I ran at the university. Of Pennsylvania in the pen relay. You did four consecutive years, and let me tell you something about did that. Did you I win? Gotta, oh yeah, well, I, I didn't <laughs> win. My, oh, yeah. We won. It was our relay team. All right. Wayne, Little Wayne State won the mile relay. Won the 880 relay. We were beating everybody. We had Bullet Billy Smith and Cliff Hatcher and Pete Petros mm-hmm. and all those guys who could fly. And I was the only uh, Caucasian runner on those relay teams. But, wow. Uh, we, so you were speedy, Gonzalez. I was. We, we, we were beating everybody. But anyway, back to you. Tell us more about oh, yourself. Oh, no, so I earned my master's. It, it, to, they're, it, it's extremely difficult. I mean, they say that it doesn't make a difference at a Ivy League, but as you know, it does. Yeah. People are really smart. And um, and it's just amazing um, how, you know, how, how things go. But anyway, yeah. I had to write a thesis. I had to write a... Uh, wrote a 300-page thesis, and then I the whole faculty votes on your thesis mm. there for an LLM So at the law school. So I, I earned my LLM, came back to Detroit. What I had prom- What was your thesis about? Um, it, was, it was actually what, what now would be the precursor to the Patriots Act because it was about the, the, the fact that you have no Fourth Amendment rights at an international border. You can be strip searched, body cavity searched, etc., and, I, and they were kind enough to send back to the back to England to the 13th century for books for me to 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 research. I went all the way back to the origins of the Fourth Amendment to see why we had this amendment that said you know about search and seizure and so forth. And so, but you can you have you have no you have no constitutional rights at inter, any at any international border. Uh, and so b- back to the point. So I came back to Detroit and uh, became a, I had promised the lawyer 
at Ford Motor Company. I had been offered a job at Ford Motor Company before I went to Penn, mm -hmm. and I insisted. This is when I learned the the, the importance of only spoke speaking to what I call green lights, not yellow lights, yeah. uh, because I wanted to go. I had been accepted at Penn. I'd been accepted at several places, and but I wanted to go to Penn. And I wanted to go, and I said, well, I need to speak to the general counsel of Ford Motor Company because they had offered me the job. And I was like, it's really geeked. They only had two other black lawyers there. And so I said, and Hank Nolte was the general counsel. I said, I have to speak to him. Oh, you can't see the general counsel. No one can see the general counsel, yada, yada, yada. I finally kept it, kept it. They said, okay, finally. So he agreed to see me. He had never interviewed a beginning lawyer or talked to a beginning lawyer before. And I told him, I said, I really want to work at Ford, but... I have this opportunity. I've been accepted at Penn. And can you hold my job for me for a year on oh, my mother and my father? I said, right, talking to him just like you and I were talking. And he smiled and he said, of course, I graduated from Penn. Oh, wow. Talk about, uh, you know, you know, the serendipity. Yeah. So, it happens. So, but it, it goes, but everyone else has said no. Yeah. But the, you go to the green light, the person who can, who can sign the check, if you will, and that makes a difference. So never settle for people that are at a lower level. So I went to Penn, earned my degree. Uh, I was offered a teaching fellowship then at Harvard, and I turned it down because I had promised, my word is everything to me. Mm. I had promised uh, Ford I was coming back. So I came back to Detroit, and then um, uh, worked for Ford, and then Mayor Young asked Henry Ford to do, uh, to, could I come and work with him because I, they thought I was smart. And he they said, put the, the rooms in together. No, yeah, the, 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 and they wanted someone that could could help them with contracts and business and stuff. And so I actually went on loan from Ford to the city for several years, kept my Lincoln Continental, kept all my corporate <laughs> benefits, all the cool stuff, and worked really hard for Mayor Young. Argued my first case in the Michigan Supreme Court uh, as AAA v. City of Detroit, won it. Uh, Anna Dix Taylor was my boss, then I became a managing attorney and created the contract and business law division for the city. Every contract that you sign with the city is now in the count it's based on templates that I created. Why haven't we run this lady for mayor? Oh, now I mean, why it, haven't we done that? <laughs> so I, I was managing you for mayor. Oh, no, we have a mayor, and and mm -hmm. and he's a and I and I refer he's to him, my friend, but I he am is mine too. Happy about some things that uh, aren't being done, but but we need point. to talk to him about that. He's a yeah. smart man. I, oh, I, absolutely. I think we need to approach him uh, about issues of concern and, and let him try to, to work it through. He's he's an excellent CEO. He really, and I say that having been a CEO, I had that legal services president CEO for 16 years. Yeah, took it from three million to ten million. Organization, I mean, he's, the guy's no dummy, but uh, I would like to see a little bit more attention paid to the neighborhoods, perhaps. Well, I, I'd like know. to see um, more support for for minority and, and women-owned businesses. I mean, mm -hmm. that too. To, to, to me, um, I, I mean, it, it appears that he's doing stuff in the neighborhoods. The, the, the neighborhoods voted for him overwhelmingly, but it's it's at that other level, that that corporate level that you're familiar with and that you're familiar with and that I'm familiar with. A lot that of we're people are just any a lot of people are disengaged. I mean, we had we only had one in five Detroiters who was eligible to vote who actually did vote. I saw that eighteen percent, eighteen percent of eligible yeah, voters. Yeah, we got to do something about that. And I'm not sure how to go about. Well, it, I, I think part of it though was that they may be they're comfortable with what's happening. I mean, I, I, there was, there was I, no firebrand. No, they have no faith in the voting system. I mean, this is Do way before so? this is way before Biden. That this is way before the ideas of whether the elections were rigged. And in Wayne County, there's always been suspicions, right? The last 20, 30, 40 years in Detroit that, well, at least 20, I would say, people are saying that maybe it's not going right. Oh, they, they talk about in whispers about broken boxes, ballots that, that are getting thrown out because when you open them up, the information is being destroyed. I mean, all of this is in gossip, mic, but, none of it, but none of it, curiously, is in public discussion. And I wonder what the fear of it is to talk about and to, and to either assure ourselves or to investigate Last more week, the we couldn't hear you at all, Sinanda. Right. I got to talk into I that mean, mic. like uh, Beverly Kendall Walker, a few other people also That's stated. That's my student, Beverly right, Kendall Walker. Also I like that her. There was a 72% error rate in, um, mm. in, in her voter count. And so, of course, if 14% if is coming out now, and there's a 72% error rate, I mean, really, we're, we're at a point of collapse. Where, where do we actually talk about? And we're, we already started talking about redistricting, but we're not talking about how to hold our, um, our institutions accountable, like the city council, keeping their votes intact, 
however well, Beverly was one of the uh, early see, every, uh, yeah, contenders for the at, city clerk's yeah. job, you know. Everybody's looking and at Denzel the mayor as a key out. role, and I don't see the mayor as being a, a key role as the interlocutor of the people's voice from the ground. It's a strong say. mayor. You know the, mayor's, ma the mayor's role is, is central to everything that we're doing. The mayor's yeah. role is central in, in leadership, but, but when we're talking about having a permeable membrane, people's voices, and new people coming in who are looking for authenticity, too. People are coming in aren't necessarily fake Speaking either, Speaking of right? the mic, Sunanda, you well, are we're, not we're speaking talking, into that mic. All right. Well, we're talking about creating a new tribe, a new authenticity, a new identity. When young people come into the city, they Detroit sells. When when people come from um, the arts department in Ann Arbor, they come because Detroit sells. And I, I think people have a real love and interest to get to know one another. I think people come to Detroit because they want to be part of Detroit. I agree uh, with that. On you know that note, saying? on that note, we need another commercial, and uh, then we're gonna we're gonna start doing what we were going to do. <laughs> uh, mainly, we we want to interview. Linda Bernard about the police commission. Okay, so yeah. that's what we're going to start doing as soon as you've done the next commercial. And you're watching the John Telford Detroit Show, coming to you live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, and other top social media platforms. Please like, follow, share, comment, and subscribe to us in our various other programming here at WJZZ, the coolest station in the world. And thank you, Dr. Sunanda Carrado, for that commercial. We are interviewing Linda D. Bernard, police commissioner in the city of Detroit. Linda, I'm going to ask this first question of you. Uh, what does the police commission do for our watchers and listeners who don't the know The police that? commission consists of 11 persons, seven of whom are elected by district like city council, and four of whom are appointed by the mayor. Whenever there is a vacancy, even in an elected spot, like, for example, if I moved away... Wait a minute. Four by the mayor. Yes. Three. No, seven. Seven, seven elected. Seven by elected. By district. The seven districts. Appointed. Eleven altogether. Yeah, eleven okay, altogether. So, but, so we have a majority that are elected. Correct. But oh, if okay. there's ever a vacancy in a spot, a person moves away or resigns, then the mayor appoints that, that person. So... So many times during the during the four year term that people are elected, like when when Conrad left, that that created a vacancy. The mayor Conrad got Conrad Miller. Yes, when he yeah. was on the board, yeah, okay. he he that created a vacancy, and the mayor appointed uh, to, to that position when he became deputy mayor. Mm -hmm. So that's a perfect example. But in any event, eleven people, um, the seven are elected at the same time you elect city council and the mayor, hmm. just like we just had the election a few weeks ago. The um, the commissioners are not paid. Um, there's no job, none of that stuff. We meet once a week. We have a, a small meeting stipend, similar to what they have the Board of Education, I think. Um, we meet once a week. The meetings last between usually three to four hours, unfortunately, and we get mm -hmm. epistles of material. Sometimes I get my monster binders and stuff of material mm -hmm. that we're supposed to address. Reverend Jim Holly is our chairperson currently. So, uh, and he's an appointee of the mayor. Um, so, I didn't even know he was on the board. Yeah, he's yeah. the chair. He's the okay. person who speaks for, for the board. Um, as you said earlier, a man of faith. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, we meet weekly. What we do is we approve all policies for the police department. We also approve disciplinary action regarding officers. But um, our act, I mean, generally, our action with respect to disciplinary action is, is very limited mm -hmm. because the real disciplinary action can only be, through, uh, as a result of collective bargaining agreements, can only be implemented by the chief. The, the, the chief uh, has the right to reject any disciplinary action, so to speak, that, that, that we might recommend uh, as a result of citizens' complaints. So that means the commission really doesn't have the power of an oversight commission that, that a real oversight commission would have. Well, well, some of our powers are limited. What we do control, we do have to approve the budget, right. which is, you and I both oh. know, is where the real power is. That's right. The power is right. always with the money. Mm -hmm. So we do approve the budget, uh, uh, and generally that's f a fairly routine process. Uh, it's not the sort of and even w and we get a quarterly report on the budget, of course, from the chief's office. Not the kind of budgetary interaction that I'm sure you're used to and that I'm used to having been on numerous boards, including the Eastern Michigan University Board, mm -hmm. where you're really talking about 
real budgetary issues and, and, and real moving money around and doing the things you have to do. Right. And of course, the budget is ultimately a, a, approved by the city council. So, East um, Michigan, you were on that board. Yeah, I was. Yeah, every time. I, I was the first black person on that board. Uh, my East picture's in the boardroom. Beautiful portrait. I was looking at an ad on television about Eastern Michigan, and I saw a picture of a hurdler. Mm. And sure enough, it was my teammate Hayes Jones. You know, we were we were teammates, you know, on the U.S. team back in the 1950s, and you know he he set eight world records. Uh, when yeah, he I know who he is at Eastern Michigan University. Anyway, I'm digressing though. But so, so so this is a civilian committee, and yes, it, it is civilian. But um, you can uh, it, you can be elected or or you can be appointed. Hmm. Um, so that that it is a civilian commission. It's an oversight board for the police department, similar to what you have with the federal government, why the president can't be a member of the military. You know, you have to have a civilian in charge of a paramilitary So, uh, So force. what kind of people do we have populating the civilian commission? What's your background, professionally, retired, otherwise? None. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Like, uh, what, like are, are, because my understanding is some of them are retired police officers. That's correct. And um, you're the only attorney? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so so what, what kind of people are filling the seats, and, and how do they come to this position? Because most people don't think, when I grow up, I think I'm going to be a police commissioner. Well, you, you've got to do something other than be a police commissioner anyway, because mm -hmm. you don't get paid as a police yeah. commissioner. Yeah. But you have another career. It's, it's, it's like any other board, a yeah. civil rights right. board right. or human rights or zoning board. You know, the, all of these boards meet, mm -hmm. and, of course, you create policy. So, but it, it was created by Mayor Young in 1974, and um, and it has it was one of the first in the country. Yeah. A at that time, you, you were asking about what was the criteria to be the um, to be the uh, commissioner. It, he had fairly stringent criteria. I mean, he had Ed Littlejohn on that on that first commission. He had Avon Cohen, du federal judge Avon Cohen. I mean, it was uh, I mean Walt Douglas. Um, Avis Ford. I mean, he had people on the commission and, who yeah, understood business. Cousin, Alonzo Little John High jumped uh, seven feet for Western mm -hmm. Michigan University. I don't know if oh. you knew that. Okay. A friend of mine. Anyway, I keep I keep digressing. And I know it's fine with field. me. I like it because mm -hmm. it, it, it tells us our history. It's right. It's relevant. Well, I'll tell you that Mayor Young, before he was ever mayor, followed our relay team avidly, and he followed yeah. me avidly when I was running in Europe, and and he was a a, a state senator. Yes, he time. was. That's when I first met him. <laughs> But uh, yes, anyway, I keep digressing because I always throw, throw a little track and field in there. You know, a lot of that's no. in, in this Any, book here. So, but so, you, so you have it, a, yeah, go on. It, anyone can run for the city, yeah. for, for, the, for the Board of Police Commissioners. And in fact, in the, I think it was the, was the 7th District, no one ran this yeah. time. And there was just write-in wow. candidates. Okay. I mean, um, whoever, traditionally, um, whoever ran was unopposed. I was opposed this time. Uh, vigorously opposed. Yeah. I think Scotty Bowman ran. I don't yes, think he, he did. He, he, yeah. he ran against. He, he was against Willie Bell. I wish he'd won. I wish he's Scotty a had he's won. a great guy oh, and, and a man. really and a really good friend of mine. I love Scotty Bowman. Yeah, and of I, course you're District Two. Yes, but but for District Two, um, I I I won for District Two, and so that's what the commission does. What I try to do in in terms of the commission is is not only be a real voice for the people. Uh, I don't misunderstand. I, I support hmm. our 2,700 officers, yeah. and we have uh, like eight or 900 civilian employees. Uh, I support them because, I mean, public safety is everything. If you don't feel safe, then hmm. then you don't you don't have a life, quite frankly. So, and and they do a great job throughout the city of Detroit. However, I I represent the community and and the community's interests, and and that includes you, John, and, and you as well, Doctor, because. Because your perspective is important. You you bring things to me that I'm not aware of. Like, for example, about um, a facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. That was up. a real, um, Willie see, Burton, see, I mean, yeah. they gave him a beat down just for advocating uh, right. for it. Well, I mean, that you speak a little bit about that, about a, a fellow police commissioner being arrested because he opposed facial recognition technology? They did more technology? than arrest him. They actually beat him. They pulled him I off mean, the table, right? Yeah, they pulled him off the table. They pulled him from the table, quite yeah. literally. Yes, and, and that was unfortunately at the command of a of the chair, who's a former sheriff, Lisa Carter. Mm. Um, oh, I mean, and That's she right. and Willie Bell have, have you know, mm -hmm. go, go, we're playing, you know, going ring around the rosy. You know, this year it was Willie, next year it was Lisa, next year it was Willie, that kind of thing. Mm. But in any event, 
um, that that was a that was disgraceful. As a matter of fact, that was one of the things that led me to run for the board the first time. Oh, okay. I just couldn't I couldn't take it. I just couldn't believe. I've served on more than thirty boards, public wow. and private, and I've never seen conduct like what was happening at, at the board that meeting. That was appalling. And I, I mean, was yeah. very very upset about that. A lot of your life's work and your very career has been about. For, for me, the theme is being a public interest. I'm a public interest lawyer. So, and I've won three cases in the Michigan Supreme Court, two that changed the law for low-income people that had existed for hundreds of years. So, yeah, there's no question about it. I'm always looking for that. I mean, my father was a, a, a waiter for 50 years at Bloomfield Hills Country Club. Mm-hmm. Black people, Indian people, could not Asian people could not be members of the club until the, like, 2000s. Um, he had well. to walk in the back door of the club. We'd, we'd go out there on Father's Day and take him a flower for his lapel uh, he'd come out the back he'd drive around to the back I mean it, it, and he was the most articulate smart person only listened to classical music ridiculous I mean I mean he was so much smarter than me but I'm I'm just saying that um, that is that is my mission that is what I've done um, and, and and that's what I do is, is advocate for those who are disadvantaged you've been on a mission and I'm looking at, at this question and this is a question that I ask you to write for me, very frankly, and I to- don't totally understand it. I should, but what are the demographics of the Detroit Police Department? And in, in using the word demographics, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, well first of all, the, the number of people I just told you are 2,700. Um, about 20% of the workforce is female. Okay, uh, only, now I get it. Uh, only about um, 50, 40 some odd percent are African American. Um, That's all. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, most of the force is white. Still, and, yeah, still, or or, like or it's very close. Thing? It may be fifty-two, fifty, you know, forty-eight, forty-nine, it, something isn't like, like that. Isn't like the union car thing, like in Hamtramck? If your father was in the force and his father was in the force, you might live in a city, but now you're in the force too. Well, yeah, I mean, but yeah, there, there, there's a lot of that, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, that sort of traditional kind of guys for in Detroit. Or? Yeah, yeah. It's mm-hmm. good, but, but most of the officers do not live in Detroit. 80% of the officers do not live in Detroit. That is not yeah. good. Is there any way that we can get that turned around? No. Nope. I think the they, officers they, saying, the officers in an article in the Detroit News were saying a couple years ago is the schools. Yeah, they don't want to live here. Yeah. Not, only the, not only the school, even the command staff and so forth, mm-hmm. they yeah. don't live in Detroit. Uh, other than the, than the chief, the, the chief has has moved into the, into Detroit now. Teachers don't live here either, and they don't yeah. put their kids in our schools. Where, where no, they, they don't. Teach. No, because they're because they, 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 they they're not viewed as school. schools, yeah. John. If you if you, you want minds are fungible. If the more they're exposed to, you know, the smarter they are. And That's if right. if you're not going to be exposed to anything. Uh, then it doesn't doesn't work, and, and and I'm you know that's that's very troubling to me, hmm. because some of the greatest people I know maybe I don't know if you went to Detroit public schools. I certainly did. Okay, K-12. you and and certainly Damon Keith and every leader that we have in our community, for the most part went to Detroit public schools. And they were a doggone good school. Central District, High. Right? Oh my God, tremendous school district. I mean, so it's it's really it's really really sad. What I was at Northwestern for two yeah, years. Yeah, Northwestern. That's where Damon Keith went. Everybody. You know. I graduated from Denby. Oh, uh, right. And Denby at the time had an English department that was almost like a college English department. They were teaching Chaucer mm-hmm. <laughs> to mm-hmm. us, you know. Right. But they were no real more. Educated. No more. And, no. and somehow or other, we've got to recover that, no, all we that teach, level of excellence. We teach the test. Yeah. Oh, right. That's unfortunate. Yes, There's it no is. The, the, the sort of thinking that, that you exhibit in this book and that you've done in your work and getting your PhD and everything doesn't exist anymore. That sort of inquisitive mind, yeah. that thinking person. What about this? How about that? How did this happen? You know, you know, how did my sister get? In my opinion, she wasn't strip searched, but almost I mean, violated yeah. at, at the border. That's what made me write my thesis on that on, yeah. on the on on the on the. On the Right on the Fourth Amendment. The Canadian border? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm just saying. But I think when people are constantly people violated, don't think. they're going to go insane if they think about it unless there's something to be done. Right. But 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 you had an inquiring mind. You have an inquiring But that's because you were in a... It's, it's what yeah. Jesse Jackson says, if you want to make money. Jesse Jackson says, if you want to make money, you got to put money in money mud. So mm-hmm. if you want if you want kids to be smart and to think outside mm-hmm. the box, you got to put them in an environment that, that encourages that. You know, it has to grow. But we can't let that defeat us as teachers, even though we've got all these handicaps to, to fight against. We, we, if you, you know, I've heard a teacher say, 
you know, I, I taught him that, but he didn't learn it. That's, that's, <laughs> like, that's, that's like true. Saying, that's what I, I think. I, I, but they I, listen to everything we it's say. It's like saying, I, 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 I built that building, but it isn't there. You right. know, I mean that's that's the same thing. I mean, and you're not we, a good dance teacher if you can't move, right? Yeah, right. We move. we have a you responsibility. I mean, it's too easy to cop out, you know, because of kids' backgrounds and because of all the handicaps that our kids are uh, facing. Or, or how about the round? I want boarding stuff? schools. That's why I told you. I well, want yeah, kids but in we school. We don't have them, so. but we could. We have enough money to do it. Oh, we got I more would love than it enough if we could. money. Right. We got, mm. I mean, you know, I mean, it it helps parents. It helps the kids. Kids, you said dance. I mean, there's yeah. no such thing as dance in, in, in schools. I mean, from 8 to 4 with their breaks and all that stuff, this this educational system exists all over the world. There used to be dance. I can remember dance. when I was coaching and teaching Art. at Pershing. I was coaching and teaching at Pershing back in the in, in 1965, yeah. 6, 7, and my, my kids won the state track, and, and uh, our basketball team under Will, uh, Will Robinson won the state basketball, and Will had those kids in a dance class and the sight, it was a sight to behold, because you had six foot nine inch Spencer Haywood up on his <laughs> tippy toes. Uh, but you know, that, that, that was good. That was good because it taught coordination. And, and I'm digressing watching. again. John Telford, right. Detroit, coming to you live Time on Facebook, commercial. YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, and other top social media platforms. Please like, follow, share, comment, and subscribe to us. And thank you for watching WJZZ, the coolest station in the world. And please don't forget to come out on December 9th. 5.30 at the Yacht Club. We're hosting a public debate, discussion, I should say, about parochiate. Um, Dr. John Telford in the Highland Park Chamber of Commerce invites you. Yes, that is true. And Linda D. Bernard, Police Commissioner, we are interviewing today. And Linda, what is the biggest challenge facing the Police Commission and the Detroit Police Department, in your opinion? Well, the the biggest challenge it, it faces our community in, in general right now is is gun violence. Mm -hmm. It's really D D Detroit police officers uh, praise the Lord uh, with respect to Chief White are, are actually using restraint, or yeah. they're supposed to be. Uh, most of them are. When they're not, we're on it. Uh, in terms of their dealings with the community. You haven't heard any of the stuff that you hear around the country and that's so true. forth yeah. that's true. In, in Detroit. And that started also with, with, that's true. With, 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 with James Craig as well. And, and so, but, but, but it's a serious uh, initiative uh, for, for Chief mm -hmm. White. So we don't have the explosive kind of things for the most part that you see in many communities. And you really saw it in that video where, they, where the guys were doing the circle eights in the street and in front of a police car, they were showing off, you know, in those well, they muscle They were doing cars. it in front of me, driving out in Jefferson. I was with V one time, the lady that's got this boutique. We were driving down Jefferson. They're doing them right in front uh -huh. of us. I said, I can't believe it. Uh -huh, they almost, right. almost hit us. Right. Uh, so you know. <laughs> so we, he sat there, hit his dash cam. That's the, one of the things that's so important that we use now. Both a, a body cam and dash cam. Watched it do all 18 circles, you know, so he thought he, he was trying to get the police to chase him. But we have a no chase policy. You think that's what he was doing? Of course. But we have, and they and, and they know we don't chase. Because we don't chase unless you're in the commission of an actual felony. Okay. Then, then we chase. But just okay. chase, Again, you know, publication. when you speed up, we it's okay. We, usually we got it on camera somehow. Somebody, we'll somebody up in front will get you. Uh-huh. And, and, and the next day, we were at their house. It was in the suburbs. These were two white guys that were doing it. Uh, it wasn't they thought they had you know they thought it was it they thought they anyway. got home right <laughs> and so we picked up those cars and arrested them and it was on a Friday it was wonderful and a <laughs> Monday was a holiday so that meant they had to spend a whole weekend in jail they couldn't even get arraigned or anything and, probably until Tuesday and Wednesday. I just want to say this gun violence was also a predecessor for the proliferation of charter schools a lot of parents started sending their kids to charter schools because it was a self-selecting process into a safer space it wasn't it wasn't a question of a quality of education yeah, it was a question of safety. Yeah, it, it, that started charter schools off. Well, I, I I thought that that the Detroit public schools were really pretty safe. Is that true, John? You would be an expert. I I'm think. not an expert anymore. On but DPS, you would be because you follow uh, it. Yeah. They, they are basically safe. They have a police uh, force. We, yeah. Well, we also we also have security guards in, yes, in, you do. in the school, mm -hmm. and um, and the the teachers themselves. You know, a lot of times you've got you've got a, a gym teacher who is you know the disciplinarian. Uh, even though that's I, not I, his I understand what you're saying, but, but I mean, just like 
in any other large schools, just like in Trent, whatever, <coughs> but there have been kids who've been bullied and who have encountered violence. Oh, well, yeah. that's going to happen with yeah. kids. I mean, well, yeah. well, 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 within any schools. You, I, I'm, not, I'm not just you saying You hit like on my here. boyfriend, and I'm mm-hmm. really mad at you. Yeah, but look at the response that happened during emergency financial management. There was an ROB because, you know, I, I did ethnography in schools. That, that, okay. That's my anthropology. So I was in the schools during that and seeing these them process their lives. Oh, Finney, uh, you were a Pershing, weren't you? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, there was this one girl, she was an ROTC girl, right? She comes out of the gym to get a sip of water. There's another girl in the hall Uh-oh. with a guy in Uh-oh. the middle of something, mm. right? So of course, she they lock eyes, and so she's threatened, and she cuts her face. Something that girls do, right? Cut, whatever. So the ROTC oh, yeah, girl and her mother, the, locks, bedlocks and the socks, ROTC everything. girl and her mother come back to talk to the principal about oh, what boy. happened to her. She got suspended for leaving the classroom for water. That's ridiculous. And she had to fight the rest of the year just to graduate. That's a, this ch- was that's a, a shame. There was another girl. This is a her, her, Yep. Her, her um, mother's boyfriend set the car on fire, blah, blah, blah. Um, three weeks from graduation, she was going to go on to college. For some reason, she just couldn't get that English grade from the teacher. That's all. So I understand what we say on the surface, but... There's, there's been a real inversion of reality for kids who go to school. For a lot of kids who go to school, that's where they end up being criminalized or attacked. Um, it's just the truth of what's going on. In a lot of cases, teachers do their best. That's why they're in those schools. You don't see a lot of new teachers. You see teachers who give in their blood and their bone you got since that the right. beginning. And they care, which is why kids still come to that's school. That's right. And I could talk about this forever, but yeah. I, I want to ask Linda... Uh, w- one important question. I think they yeah. want us to stop. I'm sorry. Are they stopping us? No, no, no. no. We got okay. we got four minutes. And four okay. minutes. Stop. Okay. Listen. What I'm what so do you excited. what do you want to accomplish as a police commissioner? Because well, I didn't get around that well, question. Well, my, my my pet project, and I need your help with this, is is actually a gun buyback program. Hmm. I am convinced. I don't want um, unlike some people who just want to lock up people and send them to what Reverend Jackson calls the All Black Male Academy, hmm. uh, which is Jackson Prison. I want to, and that, as you know, having a gun, a, a gun that you don't have a permit to carry is an automatic two-year felony. Automatic. You just automatically go. Eat women. I had a pregnant woman, nine months pregnant, everything. Really? No, yeah, she couldn't get her permit because she moved here from Kentucky. They pulled her over, she was, and they pulled her over, and she was arrested. Nine month, I mean, two-year felony. Automatic. If you don't have a permit, it was in her glove compartment. So she was on her way to work. That happened to another young yeah. mom, and her gun wasn't even loaded. No, I it doesn't matter. Victoria Harris Burton yeah. was for representing her. Her gun wasn't even loaded, and they matter. put her right in jail. She was that, pregnant, too. It doesn't matter. Th- that, so anyway, I want to do a gun buyback program, John, because I really Great think... Great idea. I, I really think that, that girlfriends, mothers, wives, and, and good fathers, if they know their kid has a gun, they will take that gun, they will bring that gun to me, just like you brought me this book, and if I can give them $250 for that gun and a dollar for every bullet, that they, they will, they will, the women themselves and the p- good parents will, will bring those guns in uh, because they don't want their boyfriend, husband, or son yeah. uh, or daughter to go to prison for yeah. having a gun. Yeah. I mean, and I'm going to yeah. give you real money that you can go get anything you want, pay your bills, get your hair done, I don't care what you do, and it's and it's totally anonymous. You can wear a, a, a Halloween mask to uh, to drop off the gun. Each gun you get paid, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I want to do. That's a great idea. And, and I, I need resources, corporate resources, to do that. I think we can pick up probably a half million gun, uh, guns in the city of Detroit. Oh, I bet we Which could. would make a huge difference in our crime statistics. It sure would. Make it you safer. Save, save a lot of lives. Right. Save a lot of lives. It's because it's it's an epidemic now. Yes, there are three guns for every one person. Probably five in Detroit. Uh, and you've been listening to the John Telford Show Detroit with Dr. John Telford and co-host Dr. Sinanda Samadhar Corrado on WJZZ Cool TV on Thursdays from 10 to 11 in the morning streaming on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. It was the late, great Dr. Wayne Dyer who said, Dr. John Telford has a warrior's heart and a poet's soul. Listen also to Dr. Telford on WCHB AM 1340, Saturday mornings at 9.30 and Monday evenings at 6.30. And tune in again next Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. And thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Excellent show. You are excellent, both of you guys. Oh, I, mean, I knew this was going to be a